We are live. Good old boys, episode eight. Bog Beef. I'm Mark. Special guest today, Big Dre. How, how's it going, boys? When I was a boy, my family would we'd occasionally go to we go to New Orleans for my father's Coast Guard examinations. He was a boat captain, and routinely you have to go take these tests that um, for as you move up in tonnages, larger ships and whatnot. And on your way to New Orleans, you're going to go across the Huey P. Long Bridge. You're going to cross the Mississippi. Which is, this bridge is infamous in the South for being scarier than hell with just a little bit of fog. You're going you're gonna to grab onto your Louisiana legal drive through margarita with, with both hands and just pray you make it over. Sometimes we would go over the Huey P. Long. The weather would be calm. My dad, who had no interest in politics at all, he believed Republicans and Democrats were the same thing. He didn't care. We would go over and he would tell me, about, he would tell me legends and stories and facts. About Huey P. About the real life Huey P. Long. Later on, I found out there's two Huey P. Long bridges. This is true of Huey P. Long himself. There's two of them. There's the man and there's the myth. We are we're surely the second source to get to you about this guy. We're going to hope to show you another side of the kingfish. That is Huey Pierce Long Jr. That is not Hubert. This is the South. We're retarded. He was absolutely unique, and we'd like to think of him as the original good old boy. No one else comes closer to the spirit of this program. You know, even before we were super into arguing about politics with people, Huey Long was one of our favorites. And he's a, like you said, a very unique figure. Today we're bringing to you somebody who actually knows things about history, someone who actually reads books. Uh, His name is Dre. And specifically, I think he's going to talk a little bit about one of the Huey Long biographies. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on, boys. Um, yeah, I was lucky enough, a friend sent me, from Louisiana, sent me uh, the T. Harry Williams book, Huey Long, which was written in the 60s, and it's probably the Huey Long biography. It's like 800 pages. It's amazing. Um, and what I like about it is um, when I was in academia, um, I did oral history, interviewing people, talking to them about their lives, getting them to talk about their lives and their experiences and specific um, uh, histories, yeah, local usually. But this guy, I mean, I interviewed like 25 people, and that was years of work to record everything, transcribe it, make sure everything was like eth- ethically sound and legal and all that. And this guy interviewed like 240 people for this, this book. It's insane. Uh, it's an incredible amount of work. And I think to what um, Bog Beef was saying, uh, it, it really like takes on at the myth of Huey P. Long and also talks about like what he actually did and demythologizes him in an interesting way where you can see kind of that, that uh, connection between uh, the myth building he did and how that served like the radical politics that were so important to him. It's important to talk about the time period. Yeah. Uh, he was born in the the late uh, 19th century, uh, and uh, you know he was he was killed when he was in his early 40s. Spoilers, uh, you know he was assassinated in 1935, September 4th, just after uh, after his birthday, and uh, yeah, so it's it's really that the, the end of I guess the Gilded Age, the Progressive Age in the American politics, uh, into into uh, Roaring Twenties and the Great Depression. And it was really like, he really got his political career started uh, in the Roaring Twenties, which I think people kind of know now as much as uh, they were called the Roaring Twenties and there was a big economic boom. A lot of people, especially farmers, were already getting hit pretty hard in the Twenties with bad uh, harvests and uh, growing debts that led to partly uh, the crash in, in 29 and then the Great Depression that impacted most of the world. So this is this is where his um, radical politics really emerge. But it's interesting. Like uh, I'm Canadian. I'm just gonna lay my cards on the table here. So I've got a got an outside perspective. But he was he was a unique. I mean, he popped up in uh, when I was taking American history, uh, and like I couldn't believe that more people didn't know about this guy. It's just absolutely radical. And if you have like a surface level knowledge, I think of the South and Southern politics at this time. You couldn't believe it either. But if you dig in deeper, you realize, like, uh, where he came from, Wynn Parish, which was one of the poorest parishes 
in Louisiana, um, it had a streak of progressive politics. It had a streak of even opposing the Civil War, a secession, um, uh, against you know the broader uh, politics of the state. Um, so the county went for Debs, right? Yeah, but like, I mean, I think Huey Long is. I think he's a really interesting case to look at for maybe how you attain power with someone with his ideas. I'm not. Uh, he's really hard to label. Um, people have, you know, lab- will label him a fascist. They'll label him a la- uh, dictator, and that's a lot because of his methods. Um, but again, if you understand like what Louisiana politics was like, it probably might reconsider that. I mean, he wasn't a socialist. I think that's fair to say too. He argued with socialists. He debated them publicly. Um, and he was sympathetic to a lot of their ideas, but he wasn't. He didn't want to abolish capitalism. He just wanted to severely, severely restrict its worst um, elements. So, some sort of social democrat, I guess. I don't know. It doesn't. You know, it it fundamentally it doesn't, doesn't matter. We, we we never we would never allow someone with his politics to rise to national power. That's why he was yeah. killed. Yeah. But you know, to, to give you an idea, like you're talking about Louisiana politics. Didn't he make his bones as a lawyer defending like a, a state senator who got indicted on the es- uh, with the Espionage Act because he he wrote I think the way he phrased it was conscript wealth for the for the upcoming war because it was going to be run by profiteers. Basically, it, my take on it was he was suggesting in, um, like an income tax to pay yeah. for the war, yeah. which is what we did anyway, but it was yeah. that... <laughs> he the was way in, it was presented. Yeah. Yeah, he was indicted, and it went before yeah. the state Supreme Court, and uh, I, uh, Huey defended him. Yeah, I don't want to I wanna take down that uh, particular um, moment for him, but I, I think that was... Like, he made more of his... Um, he, he, was, he was like an early... Um, to maybe demythologize him a bit without taking away from that, like that's important but he he made a lot of his bones um kind of early ambulance chasing almost yeah. like he, uh, <laughs> he um the workers compensation had just gotten passed in louisiana so i mean it didn't have the same kind of reputation it does have today like people were getting killed or severely injured in uh in industrial accidents and workplaces and there was no you know they were fi- workers are finally and their families are finally compensated to pay for like you know the funeral that sort of thing. Uh, he joked like he had a pretty sort of dark sense of humor about it because you could do nothing but laugh because these people were in such a miserable situation. Like he said that it was better for the widow if her husband was killed because then she wouldn't have a dependent. You know, like she'd get the money, pay for the funeral, and then she wouldn't have to like work twice as hard. To, you know, look after probably someone who is an invalid at that point. Yeah, this is before Social Security, before any kind of yeah, safety net yeah, whatsoever. Yeah, we want to we want to start giving you giving you a feel for you. He, yeah, go look at go look at a photo of him. <laughs> he definitely has gravitas that comes through. Yeah, you need to contextualize a little bit. Yeah, there's a movie I think about. I think it's the closest you get the scenario he's in. What's the uh, the Coen Brothers movie? Oh, brother, where are they? Yes. Yeah. That, it was like, I don't know if it was supposed to be the 20s, 30s, of Mississippi, 30s. but we're there. And you're going to hear his gravitas denounced in ways of like that he's like a huckster, snake oil salesman. And I'd say you have to remember what he's doing. And he wasn't a man of means to start out with either. He's constantly talking about being, you know, completely busted <laughs> in, the, in the like 20s and teens. Yeah. Absolutely. And this is a time before amplifiers are very, are, are very available. So projecting your voice... Causing a scene, getting getting everyone getting everyone's attention. That's your number one skill. And that was his bread and butter. Like absolutely, uh, it's funny. But the the, the uh, his means though were kind of funny. Uh, one in the interviews that uh, Williams does, uh, he interviews of course the whole long family, and he says his sisters complain that after he died, like. Uh, every time he retold the story about his humble origins of grow- like growing up in a log cabin, he, they lived in a log cabin for a year. Uh, it like the log cabin got smaller and smaller every time he retold it. Right, like <laughs> he could claim that he, you know, that perfect political story, like he grew up in a log cabin, it was cold as anything. Like his, he grew up in a very poor parish, absolutely no questions. But his dad did own a lot of land, and Wynn County was going through a bit of an industrial boom at the time, so he was able to make, uh, old Hugh, he was called, uh, Louis' father, was able to make quite a bit of money selling some of that land to yeah. 
development for houses and things. So they ended up pretty quickly into a colonial style house. Uh, so th they had books around when he was young, so he read voraciously. He, uh, you know, they were always talking um, at the dinner table about politics and what they had read with their father and mother were both, you know, interested in, in getting the kids educated, which was the way out, right? Um, his older brother, Julius, who he basically feuded with constantly once they were adults, uh, became a lawyer. And uh, Huey, though, in his own way, um, was one of those sort of snake oil salesmen when he was a teenager because he was selling, uh, like, I'm not familiar with it, but all sorts of like lantern oil and this sort of thing, <laughs> like newfangled lantern oil that was supposed to be better than, I mean, maybe this stuff's legit, I don't know, but I don't have any context for for uh, what he was selling necessarily, just that he was very, very good at it and making, you know, not means, but enough money, right? Yeah, he was a traveling salesman, and he used yeah. that to, f I mean, if you go by what he said, he would use it to fund his uh, his law career when he was, uh, I guess, And, and that's absolutely law. true, yeah. He had some help out from his his older brother, Julius. Uh, he couldn't go to the, he didn't have enough money to go to uh, Tulane University, which was the law school, uh, but he studied for it and managed to pass the bar anyway, without a law degree. Um and he actually went to someone on the state supreme court to ask them to uh, go for the bar early, right? Yeah. Take some balls, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Not only that is he he the, the guy told him we have to go back to when Parish to take the bar because that's where he lived. He said, "No, I'll just take you to New Orleans. It's it's fine. I'll just do it there or Baton Rouge. I've forgotten which. Uh, one of the big cities." And and he just did it, and it was fine. <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, he was, he had an amazing ability for uh, learning on his own. Um, some, some, some kid apparently later on in his career, when he was a, a governor, uh, or even state senator, or senator, U.S. senator, uh, came to him when he was staying at a hotel and asked him, like, you know, I, I don't have enough money to go to law school, but what would you suggest I do for my curriculum? And he was, like, touched by this guy, because it was exact same situation as his, and so he gave him a massive reading list and what to study and how to study it and it shows that he like understood how to prioritize how to learn not to get discouraged uh real appreciation for classics as a lot of people did like you know hmm. julius caesar and hamlet's uh Colin, count of monte cristo was his favorite book for example so he was well learned well read and he liked you know if you look at pictures like you guys said of huey long especially once he he, he ascends politically like he seemed to and Williams makes this this pretty clear is like he dressed as what his he thought his betters would dress like and people mm -hmm. like that you yeah know, people he was appealing to like he he had made it and he was wanting to lift them up too he moved on up yeah. let's put a pin in Julius Caesar we're going to come back to that but okay yeah. we've gone over his early part of his life which yeah. is very kind of got a self-made man type vibe to him but let's talk about uh hey hang on sir all right the the big emphasis here, I think, is that this is a uh, he's 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 studied, but this is this is a guy who's learned the skill of rhetoric on the, on the streets. Yeah, selling and debating. He'd go to debates all the time, and like even if he's in the audience, he'd like end up in the debate somehow. You know, he was a bit of a loud mouth, a bit of a braggart. But worked as an auctioneer. This is a th yeah. this this is a man who, who he's going to live and die. With with uh, with his with his voice, gift he of his, gab. He met his wife through a uh, through. He was. Uh, I'm a, I'm a big Hank Williams Senior fan, and when you listen to a lot of his stuff, you, the, the, the beginning there'll be an introduction by the by the um, either uh, baking flour or, or baking products would sponsor all these concerts and stuff in the South. He met his wife through. Uh, he was a, a barker for one of these uh, uh, flour or or uh, flour, or, yeah, something like this. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, his uh, his ability to, um, to to talk and then eventually learn how to needle people worked out really well. But I think the the other important thing I don't want to miss this is when he went to Tulane uh, informally, he 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 had a class with a professor who talked about um, French, you know, Louisiana, and we should probably talk about like the the weird wonderful politics of Louisiana because it's not like anywhere else in the South or anywhere else in the United States, especially at this time. Yeah, but it has some connection to the South, of course. But he, he you know, the, the prof was talking about uh, French 
uh, inheritance law and how it mm. derived from the Napoleonic Code and all this stuff. And he was like, well, where does you know that come from? And he's like, well, if you want to go back to the basics, the, the moral sort of center of uh, our legal system in Louisiana, it's the, the Hebrew, Hebrew law and the Bible. You know, and he go. He went, and so Huey went back to his Bible, and he went to Leviticus and uh, Deuteronomy, um, talked, uh, which expanded sort of the laws set down by Moses, and he, he found like that they were talking about uh, how everyone's debts were forgiven every seven years, jubilee. and on the jubilee, everyone's wealth, everyone's property is returned to them, and he thought like the this is the foundation of how our society should be run and throughout his career he would always go back to the bible as the reason uh for why wealth should be redistributed like aggressively yeah he was like a baptist and distributist yeah yeah religion was always a very important part of it and this is a uh, something that is lacking in, in american progressive politics right now and then in latin america and they have a history of combining uh, theology and politics but we don't have that here not uh, probably since that era, honestly. Yeah. yeah. My plan is that our government should call in this surplus wealth above a few million to any one family and then distribute out to those who have the need of the same. Some criticize that plan, but it, is, but it is prescribed by the Bible. I read you the words of the scripture, quote, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. See Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 36. Now you may criticize what I'm saying, but there it is written in the Bible. So we've talked about his early life and his early law practice, but uh, that's not why Huey Long's famous, and that's not why he's killed. Uh, he's famous for what he did to Louisiana politics, which and uh, how how did that start out? So he he um, looked at all the kind of different positions uh, out in Louisiana, and he decided to run for the Highway Commission, which was a regulatory body, and they handled. Kind of, despite the name, they did handle roads, but they also handled utilities, which included the rail. You have to consider, like early 20th century, there's actually a lot more public utilities than I think there are now. I could be wrong. The, on that. It's 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 the railroad commission, and and uh, to this day, even in to this day, they're extremely powerful because, for whatever reason, they have jurisdiction over oil. Yes. Yeah. See, I, I don't so, I don't know this stuff. That's that's fat. Yeah. Okay. That's good yeah, to know. Uh, I, I did a little bit in the oil business. Any, the the railroad commission that's that's the that's the institution yeah. for the uh, for the oil business. Well, and the railroads were built by the same guys. Yeah. So yeah, it was, all, it was all part of the monopoly. I mean, this is part of the gilded age. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess yeah, I guess the railroad. I think it was in Louisiana. It's the highway. They it was. I think that was like a, the leftovers of the progressive movement trying to regulate all this stuff and take the power away from. Um, the big oil companies. The Standard Oil Company, of course, is yeah. is the the dragon that Huey Lee uh, Huey Long pardon me, Huey Long goes to to slay. You know, it is his uh, the thing he always he he first champions as he acts as the people's champion to take on, and then later as he gains more and more power, it's just an easy um, you know easy horse to. Uh, easy bag to go back and, and punch whenever he needs to um, because he's he's reined in pretty well as, as much as you can um, uh, any any company but from what uh, William says the Standard Oil Company was like the company in the south too like there weren't yeah. a lot of big companies like it which made Louisiana kind of unique in that respect and uh, I mean, it's also worth. So he and gets elected pretty easily to the to the commission, and immediately starts tackling oil. Now he can't, uh, you know, tax or anything, but he can expand regulations to include more, you know, more businesses, more transactions that starts needling the Standard Oil Company. He's constantly railing against it. Uh, you know, this is sort of 
late uh, 19-teens into uh, mm -hmm. towards 1921. And, uh, and it's worth, uh, sorry. He had some involvement with smaller oil companies himself, didn't yes. he? Yes, yeah, later on, yeah. He had, there's a... But Standard, at this point, controls like 88% of the yeah. oil, the refined oil of the United States. Yeah. This this is John D. Rec, Rock, Rockefeller, and if, you, if you're from Florida, you know this name, Flagler. There'll be, there's all these palatial uh, estates turned into to colleges lying around. These guys just, I mean, I don't think there's a, I don't know if Bill Gates has as much of a share as, as, they, as Rockefeller had, but it's just a monster. Yeah, and they have a plant refinery, I think it was, but it was a plant at the time. I, I'm not sure if it was a refinery then. I know there's refineries in Louisiana now, but there's a ref, uh, plant in uh, New Orleans, which employed like 8,000 people, so it had you know uh, territory in Louisiana. And I think it's, you can maybe cut this in if you want or whatever, but it's worth talking about the politics in Louisiana, which at least as me as a Canadian, I can both kind of relate to um, because of <laughs> some of the politics in provinces, but also I think are very different from a lot of the politics in the rest of the United States. So Louisiana had uh, has two divergent populations. You have the Catholics in the south and the, mm -hmm. the, the Anglos, the Protestants in the north. Um, and of course you have the Afri African Americans, but because of Jim Crow laws, they don't really play. I think uh, William said like 8,000 African Americans could vote in the whole state. So, like it or not, they c didn't have much of a... Uh, for politicians vying for votes, they didn't have much of a say. Politics did not revolve around them at all. Um, so you had the major divide was the, the Anglo-Protestants in the north and the, the Cajun um, French Catholic south. And there was a system set up where senators, two U.S. senators, one be from the north, one be from the south, and you'd alternate as needed to have that keep that balance of power. Um, the Ku Klux Klan, which comes in into play with uh, Huey's um, run, uh, governor go governor run in, in 1923, 24, it plays a big role because religion's a big issue. The Klan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, like I said, Long was Baptist, not Catholic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, he was from the north, that redneck hillbilly, sorry, yeah. that hillbilly north, I shouldn't say my name. And, and it's okay, we're, we're giving you the R word back. Thank you. This is like the root for, for hillbilly. So <laughs> I know. <laughs> and then you, you, you had those two rural, rural kind of divides, and then you had New Orleans, the city itself, which was ex like one of the more bigger metropolises in the south at the time. I think, and it had its yeah. own party machine in that city, and of course, since it's in the south, Louisiana is part of the South. It's democratic to the point where there is no Republicans running. Everything's done through Democratic convention. The governors, yeah, the so, yeah, yeah all exactly. the primaries. So when he's running in twenty four, he's running twenty three, twenty four. Really, everything's set back because everything's decided through the primaries and Democratic parties there. But Louisiana is weird, like. There's no party machinery throughout the state, uh, especially every sheriff runs his own parish. And parishes different than districts, but they kind of work. Uh, usually you have a few parishes amalgamated into districts. But you have sheriffs running things in different parishes, and they have a lot of autonomy about who they go for, which means it's easy to kind of divide and conquer and build your own uh, coalition. But also they can... Uh, they can express quite a bit of independence when they want to. And then New Orleans had its own, it had the only party machinery in the South, according to Williams anyway, in the city, called the, the Old Regulars, who were um, very conservative, very sort of uh, genteel. And that was reflected in the politics of Louisiana for since Reconstruction, basically. It was a con mm -hmm. deeply conservative people, uh, the 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 conservative wealthy wealthy you know um, planter class planter class had its interests those interests were protected there's no need to change anything which led to Louisiana having a lot of poverty now it's a bit different too it wasn't just the planter class because unlike cotton unlike other southern states where it's just cotton there was also the sugar interests as well as 
some industry through the oil and the Standard Oil Company, and you had the lumber, l lumber interests in the north. So you had these semi-industrial as well as agricultural interests running things. So again, united in not wanting to change anything or rock the boat, but also easily um, divide and conquered if needed. Sounds familiar. Yeah. So his first run, the you said the, the KKK played a role in the campaign. Yeah, well, he, um, there were three candidates, him and two of the others. Uh, uh, Sanders, I believe, was the, the governor. I could be wrong about that. And there was another guy who ref, uh, represented the sort of Catholic South. So you had the pro-Klan candidate, uh, an anti-Klan candidate, Catholics, because, you know, the Klan viewed the Catholics as papists and all this stuff. Yeah. And, were, and then Huey, who had some, because he was from the North, had has some relatives uh distant relatives who were clan members or clan leaders but the clan was kind of not on board with Huey and Huey had did everything he could to avoid dealing with the clan issue he would not state one way or the other whether he was for or against it he said explicitly like it distracts from economic issues it's not important and the clan itself i think the leadership was kind of pretty much against him except for one or two relatives because they found like their members were all very pro Huey Long but then the leaders as, as well, relatively wealthy northern <laughs> whites didn't like any of his ideas you know uh, this sounds extremely familiar now. Yeah. this is one thing you're going to get when you, when you look into Huey Long and none of it will ever slot in perfectly enough the reason why you, reason why you don't know about Huey Long so much, the reason why he's not thrown around or everywhere it's because he doesn't slot in just right it's like a trump or a sanders or the iraq war or these narratives that that, that moneyed interests care about but holy shit you're gonna hear you, you you're gonna see a lot of themes pop up the, yep. and the way the way and so and it's not 100 percent consistent but there's a lot of there's a lot of quotes and things where when he's looking at the um identity politics up he's i mean when people um the uh he, I mean, he's definitely got on his mind to stay out of the crab in a bucket. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't really, he doesn't. I remember in the past that there were criticisms that he was racist, not just racist, like, you know, 1930 racist, but, you know, he was especially bad racist demagogue because he didn't deal with any of the issues that blacks faced in Louisiana, which yeah. uh, I'm That's just, insane, but... But that that is the critique, you know. That, but this is you know this is a very old story. This is how you neutralize a right. populist yeah. leader. I mean, he he was a like. It's harder for me to read some of this shit he says about African Americans because he has the same attitude as a lot of people people in the South that he grew up with that he lived with. Like I'm sure you guys are much more familiar with like the history and everything. And like you know, we have a different kind of history of race in racism here but not better just different but like when he did race like every politician in the south at some point probably engaged in race baiting where they'd say this person you know has a black relative or something right the few times he did it it's a disaster he's horrible at it he can't, he didn't very very rarely but when he did it he was absolute garbage at it he just couldn't even like not even you know people were ready to buy this shit and then he couldn't he couldn't do it it was embarrassing <laughs> like it's actually kind of funny what a gift in the middle east they have this concept of the evil eye right the evil eye is in science they have that thing where you can change you sometimes you can screw up the experiment just by the observation right right and i read a couple things where this was sort of his attitude brilliant enough to, to earn him a bullet yeah. <laughs> so he ran unsuccessfully for governor one time. We yeah, it's worth talking about, about his platform if you want. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, he was he was the big one was that really got him a lot of attention and a lot of support is um, uh, textbooks, free textbooks for for children, school children, and this is one of the policies. Like, if you actually think about it, he didn't discriminate if you're Catholic or Protestant, black or white. Every single student in any school system got their textbooks for free provided by the state um, and then 
you know, some taxes to to cover that, but that was really the, the free textbooks and, you know, starting the very beginnings of starting to subsidize education a bit more and uh, and get the state involved a bit more. Talking about the, the unique environment of here here yeah. in, in Louisiana, and I was reading someone was complaining today in the news that uh, I was reading an article saying there's a barrier between the anglophone and the <laughs> francophone worlds. That uh, you know France is is sort of a week behind uh, whatever's going on in London. That this is also true with, with Louisiana. Louisiana is just different, man. They have parishes instead of counties. Yeah, we we're talking about the north and the south. These are these are these good old boy networks. Yeah. If you've watched mob movies, this is how business gets done. By the way, uh, this is another way that, that New Orleans is. You, you got to really imagine New Orleans ha- is, almost has a wall around it. That's, this is like a perfect incubation zone yeah. for someone like you to create someone like you. Yeah. It had its own. New Orleans is crazy. It had its own politics. It had gambling and mobs, and everyone was on the take. Louisiana, like. Uh, People got like almost 19th century race science about Louisiana at the time, where corruption was just so accepted. It, it's it's a disaster. Like it's it's all the the French people, the French blood. They just accept you know corruption offhandedly, and it's true. Louisiana was a corrupt place, but to me, it strikes me really like they were just honest about it. Like people yeah. were on the take. Yeah, they were on the take. You know, you had to grease hands to get stuff done. It was accepted. You did it, and you got things done. Cor- corruption is f- is like friction against like the large mega like you could almost say friction against like uh, global capital yeah these things like this this is like oh you know you signed that law in DC you know we're, this is the swamp baby this- corruption is informalized lobby basically no I, I can I got a better definition of what he had like a patronage network right yeah yeah patronage uh, he, yeah. what this really is is this is law it's lobbying outside the bounds of the established players it's when someone a free agent comes in and starts lobbying for himself then it's corruption yeah. if there's a flow chart to criticisms of Huey Long that I've seen over the years and the first one starts out that he was authoritarian which is true he took over he took over the government of Louisiana and he tyrannical in his in his rule and uh, he used the that power to do actually good things so most people wouldn't care about that second step on the flow chart is he was corrupt and like i said this is, comes down to what are the go- in the end game of your corruption are you bribing people to get your cousin overpaid on a government contract well nobody supports that a great example in American politics, we used to have the uh, earmarks. You would say, vote for this bill, I'll attach a rider to it that'll you know, give you a little taste so you'll support it. Pork barrel spending. That's not, a, a, that's not great. People don't like that kind of corruption, but they can deal with it and they can understand it. And then the third flip on the flowchart was he was racist. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny to me, too, because once you realize the system he was replacing, he, was, he wasn't revolutionary in the sense that, like, he took Louisiana politics as they were and worked with it. Like, patronage existed before Huey Long and continued after him. He was not the instigator of patronage, but somehow he gets uniquely accused of of being, uh, of using patronage to... uh, (laughs) Familiar. Yeah, yeah, you know. uh, Corruption. He used patronage, like any other political actor, to guarantee loyalty within his organization. And... He was fine with a bit of corruption because it kept everyone honest with him. Um, now, was he personally corrupt? I mean, we can get into that. But uh, the way he used patronage was the way the conservatives before him used patronage. And interestingly enough, um, if you want to talk about like his, getting into his, his early run in politics, what I read recently was uh, he... Uh, I, if he had any political sort of um, influence, it was studying a an actual uh, a carpetbagger uh, governor, I know C word, uh, of Louisiana, Warmuth, who took over the state legislature, uh, got them to let him the governor assign jobs all over the place, went into the legislature and told people how to vote which, as we talk about it, we'll find out Huey did a lot of that. And he really admired the guy in the way he was able to take control of the state and run things. And then he sort of improved on that formula. Because what Huey was going up against wasn't just, you know, him running against other Democrats. He was up against a conservative, a deeply conservative elite 
uh, establishment. And the genius is he built an entire political machine basically by himself, uh, based on getting out his message to the people and getting people to vote for him in uh, using sort of new technology and uh, new ways of thinking and, and supporting this like really popular message that uh, was increasingly wanted. Like the state, state intervention was something more and more people wanted and the conservatives just didn't get that. He used radio a lot, right? He got into radio, but the first thing he really used is, uh, Bobby, if you mentioned uh, amplifiers weren't very big, but he, he got a sound truck early on. So not only would he roll into your town <laughs> and be able to like, yeah, amp, amp, amp his speeches, but he would also roll in before and say, Huey Long is going to speak, you know, in the town center at uh, two o'clock. So he'd advertise. And the other thing was circulars. Um, you guys, like basically the uh, pamphlets, flyers. Yes, print. we know. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Circulars. He was big on early. He, he found some printers who would, uh, who who worked with him, and he just just flooded the state with circulars to get his message out. And again, he, he, he could made it. Right. He concise. made a direct appeal to the people. Yeah. Always. Which is which is always this is this is the big uh, the sin that they can't forgive these populist demagogues. And before I, I we'll put a pin in it again, but it reminds you of someone. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly does. At the at the moment when Caesar's declared a, a Indian <laughs> state, I'm sorry, you, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to do this. <laughs> what have you done? Whenever Caesar gets brought up, I, I go nuts. Uh, the moment Caesar is sort of declared enemy of the state, they've realized that this one guy has built this machine. This, this, is, this is something that doesn't happen very often. Huey, people wake up one day and they're like, holy shit. This guy, this guy has networks of people loyal to him. He's built power without, I mean, it's a, it's incredible what he was able to do without. People say, oh, you're going to hear this a lot. They say, oh, he's authoritarian. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is, and by the way, uh, most of the time when I hear him referred to as a fascist, they 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 literally think that that word is interchangeable with authoritarian. Yeah. Okay, okay if you're trying to move a shitload of money from um, powerful people, move it down down the chain yeah. or just take it from Standard Oil. Um Sorry, this is an imp- this is an imposition. This, this is not a, this is not a passive maneuver. Would you kindly? Yeah. Okay, so we, we've we've established where he came from. We've established he made it into power and, and how he got things done. Yeah. Let's talk about what he wanted to do as both governor and later senator. That was so earth shattering that he had these powerful people. Franklin Roosevelt called him what the most dangerous man. One of the two so- most dangerous. Right. Who, who was the other one? Uh, I think it was um, uh, MacArthur. <laughs> so one was the general, uh, the most powerful general in America, and the other was this U.S. senator from Louisiana at that point. I was elected railroad commissioner of Louisiana in 1918, and they tried to impeach me in 1920. When they failed to impeach me in 1920, they indicted me in 1921. <laughs> and I, when I wiggled through that, I managed to become governor in 1928. And they impeached me in 1929. <laughs> I mean, yeah, one of the things he was also good at is insulting people and going after people and just you know, breaking that decorum that everyone complained about. He, he would lob accusations of people and just bring them down to his level. And I think that's where some of the, the demagoguery accusations come for, come from. But I think the thing to keep in mind, I think Williams does a good job, and some of their, you know, more smart commentators understand, like, everything he did was calculated, more or less. Sometimes he's human, he got a little too into it, or he miscalculated or whatever. But everything was designed to bring down people, get them angry, get a response, and then take the high road. You know, like, oh, you know, spend f- two minutes responding to whatever nonsense they've just shouted at you because you got them mad, and then use that attention to talk about your platform. He was really good at it. And any kind of uh, vindictive streak in him was always for the me- purpose of gaining power no matter what gaining power 
getting power so you can do use that power. It wasn't just powers for power's sake, but it was power to get stuff done. So, what did he want to get done? Well, the so he ran unsuccessfully in 23, 24. Um, but at that point, the conservatives were happy because, hey, we beat Huey Long. This guy's going to go away. But if you looked at the results, you'd found that most of rural Louisiana, north and south, went for him. And it was just New Orleans, populous as it was, didn't go for him. He had a, he, but he had made a bigger dent in that vote than anyone expected. Um, and I think smart people would have started freaking out, but these guys <laughs> had been in power for so long, they weren't going to worry about it. When he finally gets in in 28, Yes. A uh, huge infrastructure guy. Yes, yeah. That, I think the infrastructure came really in 28 where he was starting to pave roads. And he was smart about, I really I like this about the, the paving roads, is he wanted to get people hooked on them. So what he did is once he could start um, getting roads paved as governor and through the legislature, he'd have like a road in a town paved and then move on to a different town. Just give him a taste of a paved road and he knew that that would get everyone, you know, just pumped to get to support, push their legislation, their 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 representatives oh, to get more and more roads paved. Yes, you know, rural people doing this that never went away. When I was a kid, our road was a gravel road, and everybody on the road would send letters to our uh, our local congressmen and people in the, in the county board of supervisors, constantly complaining about getting our road paved until they find until finally, when I was like ten years old, they did it. Yeah, my grandparents were the same way on the farm. Like they were lobbying, lobbying, lobbying to get the road. And then, of course, when they did it, they forgot they didn't grade it properly. And now the the south part of our field uh, floods, and my parents and my grandparents never forgave them for oh, for doing that. That's brutal. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's double edged sword, but still, I mean, yeah. Anywhere rural, you get a paved road, and life just gets so much better. Right now, he's in state government, and state government is the vast majority of it is roads and schools. Yep. Especially then. Yeah. And and he made some forays into healthcare where he started building uh, more hospitals, which not only expanded uh, the number of beds for uh, people in general, but even African Americans. Uh, because, you know, you'd have to have segregated hospitals, and so he wanted to build hospitals, so he'd build more to accommodate that population and uh, and really made a difference there. Although, again, he never talked about it directly because that would basically be electoral poison, but it's something he did. Distributing land and money and stuff, that's not really on the table yet for him. And, of course, he had to raise money for all this, and that is where things got really complicated because <laughs> Louisiana, you had to uh, mend the... Con there was a constitutional uh, amendment saying you had to, I think, amend the Constitution to add a tax which, you know, required more of the legislature than would just to pass That's a, a poison pill. Yeah, yeah. So and Louisiana was already like that. So it was hard as hell. And, um, and uh, so when he, in the first year of, of his governorship, he's doing all this. He's expanding patronage, of course. He is mm -hmm. absolutely getting uh, all his allies into jobs. Uh, there's some pretty amazing, like, power moves. Like, he made everyone, he appointed, sign an or not sign, but write a, a resignation, an unsigned resignation letter and, and give it to him, <laughs> which he held in the vault, just, you know, for a rainy day, which was amazing. That's something War, War, uh, War's Mouth, the, the carpetbagger Louisiana governor did. and uh, so They tried to get rid of him, right? They tried to impeach him? Yeah, and the reason was he, he tried to implement a five-cent manufacturer's tax on oil. <laughs> That's what did it. Uh, but finally, so they had had enough. Standard Oil uh, really pushed, and the legislature um, voted to impeach him for uh, right misdemeanors crap. and a whole bunch of crimes, from fondling a stripper in New Orleans to uh, saying naughty words to uh, um, mismanaging funds, which, I mean, you could accuse anyone of. Like, a whole list Probably of things. True. Probably true. Yeah. This, this, go, this goes to a a question that you have to ask yourself. It's a moral question, which yeah. is, and we touched on it before. Is it 
is it morally improper to be involved with corruption and graft if you're doing it to actually accomplish something good for the peop the people? Because if so, you're you're really doing what they elected you to do. And, and I think that's that would be the way I would characterize it. If you're doing it to build roads and schools and hospitals, yeah, then I'm okay with that. And the people who aren't are generally they're trying to rules lawyer you away from spending their money, which is which is pretty much the deal with Long, right? The people who were against them were the ones who were going to have to pay for a lot of this yeah. stuff. Oh, and the the bridges that Bog Beef mentioned, those were built uh, in this little spat. He had one year one year as governor before the legislature revolted, where he had sort of a tenuous hold and was able to pass some of the good things because he had enough allies to do so, but the, the tax was just too far. And like like... Williams interviews like Huey Long supporters and the conservative opposition. He, he talks to all sorts of people. So he f- he found a guy who uh, w- admitted like impeachment was you can impeach for anything. A misdemeanor can be anything. Impeachment is a political move. Uh, <laughs> resonates today a little bit too. <laughs> okay, so or it's around this time when he's kind of solidifying his hold over the legislature that the Great Depression happens and yeah. Yeah. This is really what's going to catapult him to nationally known figure. He was so famous. He, he, there were national contests of the most handsome man in America, and, and he won one of them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, so this is what this is how he became a household name, and uh, it was always near and dear to his heart. This idea of wealth redistribution, and to be fair, it wasn't just long. I mean, this was something that a lot of Democrats were talking about between Wilson and Hoover, right? Yeah. And let's not forget the progressive Republicans. Like, it was way, to to me, in my understanding of it, is way less ideologically, like, split like it is today. I mean, is it even ideologically split today? I don't know. But the point is, like, it, it crossed party lines. You had a few Democrats and the very progressive Republicans in the North who were all about this um, to varying degrees. So around the time, around the time of the Great Depression, would it be fair to say that he kind of shifted his focus? Yeah, he, he wanted to become a national. He wanted to become a national figure. He didn't just want to be state king of Louisiana. He had endless ambition. Like, let's be f- straight up about this. Like, it's almost exhausting. Like, by the time he was, he survived the impeachment crisis because he made it about him versus Standard Oil, and and he also made some really shrewd political moves about securing enough, uh, basically buying up as needed. Uh, and let's again be clear, Standard Oil and the conservatives were also buying up politicians too. Like, they've, you know, politicians would admit, sorry, I've already been bought. Um, but he managed to out buy and outmaneuver uh, the conservatives who wanted to impeach him, and they beat it, uh, beat the impeachment before it got too far. I mean, an embarrassing way too for the conservatives. So he was able to solidify and consolidate <laughs> power even more. Uh. The funniest thing though was, like, he tried, he, he, went through his governorship um, and then tried to run as for sta- uh, senator and governor <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> he was just going to stay as governor and, and then become a senator and didn't see, you know, why not, right? <laughs> if you're that popular, you may as well go for it. <laughs> Which is amazing and awesome. But he got shut down pretty hard on that. Um, even his own supporters were pretty... That's a little too far. Yes. Yeah. So he he found uh, um, a proxy uh, of Governor Allen, who basically did whatever he said. I mean, he really didn't have any uh, choice in the matter. He was a long man through and through. And you're starting to see both like the the strength of his of his uh, machine that he's building up. He's building up loyal people who will do what he says, um, get shit done, uh, which lets him survive impeachment. And a strong, like, popular following. But also, you remove Huey Long and what do you have? He is so dominating and so such a huge personality. Like, he, there isn't much of an organization without him to keep things moving. And he is tireless. He's working all the time, it's constantly. always happens with these kind of... Yeah, he's, he's literally controlling the money. If the money isn't in his... his uh, between the uh, bosoms of his secretary, it's in a vault somewhere. No lie. That's that's what he did with his money. <laughs> so. Okay, so he he runs he runs for Senate in like thirty two whatever. Yeah, thirty two. He's allied with Roosevelt, right? 
Initially, yeah, Roosevelt sees, sees him as a useful part of the Demo- uh, up and coming popular Democrat, and uh, and yeah, and he not only does uh, Roosevelt al- align with him, but he aligns with Roosevelt. And the thing to keep in mind, though, is once Roosevelt wins the nomination and eventually the presidency, he's running the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party has its own patronage system that Mm -hmm. Roosevelt dispenses. And that leads to the initial friction because um, the the Senate, uh, his run as senator is smooth. Uh, He gets in. uh, There's some opposition, but he defeats you know them, and he's continuing to consolidate power and get more and more powerful. And the conservative reaction is getting more and more desperate, where they're starting to. Um, there are people talking about wanting to kill him at this point. Um, it's just a few people, but it's getting starting to get worse and worse. And he has bodyguards since '28, right, um, with him at all times. Uh, people he trusts, even the state police is called in sometimes to protect him, and. Uh, so when he gets to the Senate, the U.S. Senate, um, he doesn't do much at first. just sits and watches and waits. And eventually he gets up and starts talking about, you know, Roosevelt promised that we were going, we were going to redistribute the wealth in this country. If we do not redistribute the wealth in this country, we will have a socialist revolution. Uh, there is no, you know, no way around that. We have to do this. It's important, it's necessary, and it's moral. And he brings in the Bible as he normally does. And in that, and he starts pushing the administration on everything it proposes, it brings to the, the U.S. Senate that needs to go further left, it needs to be more radical, it needs to be more ambitious. And this is where he starts formulating the, the Share Our Wealth program. Um, and, and, and sort of... Uh, Use, he used uh, he was looking for a, a phrase to capture it, and every man a king comes up which is I think a William Bryant Jennings maybe uh, I might be getting that wrong but it's from the night uh, the uh, speech uh, every man uh, of a nineteenth American nineteenth century presidential candidate um, every man a king but no no man wears a crown uh, basically this this capturing the idea of massive redistribution of wealth no more no one gets to have more than a million dollars in the united states and that's it's intent if you've you never heard this platform before it's it's something else but when they've got everything on the god's living earth that they can eat and they can wear and they can live in and all that their children can live in and wear and eat and all their children's children can use then we got to call Mr. Morgan and Mr. Mellon and Mr. Rockefeller back and say, come back here. Put that stuff back on this table here that you took away from here that you don't need. Leave something else for the American people to consume. And that's the problem. It's, yeah, it's not the wealth tax that you, you see in the Democratic primary today. No, no, it it's... Is, it's way more ambitious. Yeah, and like, there will be people, you know, think tanks who will put Pinocchio's on it or some shit and like no right. was it de- detailed and like factored out and priced no no it was a vague notion that this is what he wanted to do and he articulated on it over time up until 35 but it was it was more about capturing the sentiment of of what people wanted we have eight uh, propositions of the share of wealth yeah. <laughs> number one no person should be allowed to cu- accumulate a personal net worth of more than 300 times the average family fortune. A graduated cap- capital levy tax would be assessed on all persons with a net worth exceeding $1 million. Holy shit. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you figure that's $19.35, but that's still... Yeah. And it's not just a tax on wealth. It's like a jobs guarantee. Uh, it's a housing guarantee. Yes. It, it's, yep. it's by far... It's. With all the scaremongering about Bernard Sanders, uh, Huey Long's plan was far more radical. Which, of course, it's a more radical time. It was in, it was in the midst of the depression. Yes. And his break with Roosevelt, he had he criticized a lot of the New Deal programs in a way that I think, if you look back, he was he was he was right. And he wasn't the only one complaining about the NRA. No. Didn't he? Didn't he have a have a, like a filibuster against one of the? Was it Glass Steagle? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't uh, wasn't radical enough. He was an amazing filibuster. He became a uh, 
a celebrity in the Senate, really. Like, you, when you went to Washington, you, you know, want to see the Monument, the Smithsonian, and Huey Long speaking in the Senate, because he could go on. He had, like, an 18-hour filibuster, but because everyone in the, a lot of the Democrats in the Senate hated him, they wouldn't let him, like, have bathroom breaks or anything. So you hear, like, 18-hour filibusters or whatever. They get, like, 40 breaks. Like, they can just, you know, stall. He got nothing. He got two. It was just incredible. Didn't he say during that filibuster? I don't know if this is legend or, or if it was true that I, he said, "I'm starting to, I'm starting to convince myself of my arguments." Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he could, and he could talk on any subject. You know, he had that ability just to like think and talk and talk and talk, and people would learn. You know, it wasn't just utter crap. He wasn't reading like his his grandma's cookie list although he may have resorted to to that recipe you know uh, hey bob know. what's the let's, let's get on this list uh, quickly just to marvel at it back to the share of wealth number two annual incomes will be limited to one million and, and inheritances will be capped at five point five million dollars <laughs> this is absurd um Every family was to be furnished with a homestead allowance of not less than one-third the average family wealth of the country. God damn. <laughs> Every family was to be guaranteed an average, an annual family income of at least $2,000 to $2,500, or not less than one-third the average family income. So it basically, so every... You, UBI, it, jobs guarantee, housing guarantee. Uh, so the next is old age pension, so that we, we have Social Security now. Um the next one, to balance, maybe you can explain this one. To balance agricultural production, the government would preserve store surplus goods, abolishing the practice of destroying surplus food and other necessities due to lack of purchasing power. What the uh, hell does that mean? Well, and, and it was a big problem in the Depression, even before the Depression, because um, the Depression hit farmers earlier and first. In the 20s, there were, um, you know, bad That's harvests, cool. bad weather. Um, Dust Bowl was already starting. People forget that, but... You know, um, and there was just too. Mu- they were producing too much because um, the economy collapsed. People didn't have the purchasing power to buy shit anymore, and so people couldn't buy the the vegetables and fruits and the food that farmers produced, or the cotton, or you know the sugar, all that stuff. They would just so throw it out. They just have to throw it out. As governor, he had to sign. He he tried to get a whole bunch of southern governors on board, but I think he was the only one that prohibited cotton growers from planting for a year just to help get the surplus of cotton down to get the price back up that may you know economists might throw a fit at that but they this is these are the solutions they were trying to do the government was trying to do something because nothing else was working right um but he was the only one who signed that. He couldn't get any of the other states on board, so it didn't really work because you still had everyone else trying to produce cotton to produce. Because what are you going right. to do? Not plant? That's you know, yeah. yeah farmers aren't going to do that. So the, the, that's that's where that comes from, and it just got worse in the depression. People couldn't buy anything, so they definitely couldn't buy what farmers were producing. So it just got thrown out, destroyed. Whatever. So this is like that that John Oliver, uh, the the food waste, the, the, the making the government do it. Yeah, and you won't, and, you know, I think a lot of governments learn from that and learn from the Great Depression. Uh, this is my problem with, like, people who talk about the free market. Find me one successful, and you can cut this editorializing if you want, but find me one successful... This is good horse. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, buddy. This is all we do. Is that go for Hell it. yeah. Find me one successful country in the world that doesn't have, like, a firm grip on its food production and agricultural, agricultural production find me one like no country lets that get away let's let's people you know maybe it's starting to happen now with being able to speculate on on stuff but uh no no like the state you know the u.s now has reserves for every major sort of agricultural uh product or did at least in the 50s uh because of the 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 30s and the war uh and and in Canada we have like supply side dairy, which people hate because it means more expensive. But it means no milk farmers going bust because production just drops like a rock, or the prices get out of control. Everyone can make a living, and it all comes from this kind of 
economic situation that we've all forgotten about because we've all had surplus food, cheap food for so long. Not just that, we're used to interventionist government yeah. that came about after the Great Depression that just really didn't exist in, in the Americas, at least at this time. Yeah. Okay, so number uh, number six, this is brings back the most dangerous man in America. Veterans will be paid what they were owed. Yeah. Pension, which, uh, that goes back to the bonus, it right? Does. The bonus, bonus army. army and everything. Yeah, direct, um, yeah, confrontation we're, over that basic political we don't need, We don't need to, you guys, you guys should know what that is. If you don't, yeah. World War One veterans were, were owed a bonus later on. They said, hey, we want it now because of the Depression. Uh, Hoover attacked their hobo camp. And, With uh, General MacArthur leading the way. Yep. Yeah, so. Yeah. For seven, I'm sorry, free education and training for all students to have equal opportunities in all schools, <laughs> colleges, universities, and other institutions for training yeah. in the professions and vocations of life. Really starting to sound familiar, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, Huey was huge on education. Uh, he provided, another thing he provided was um, literacy cl- classes, like uh, night nighttime literacy classes for everyone in Louisiana. So literacy rates skyrocketed especially amongst the African-American population that took advantage of it. Uh, he was also a big... Uh, he, he loved Louisiana State University. He uh, basically adopted and uh, almost ran it himself as governor and senator. And I don't know, we can have that as a side or talk about that later, but it's that's some of the, the better uh, Huey Long moments in that. At least half the... Um uh, the legendary stories my father would tell me would would be the, his exploits connected through LSU. Yeah. Number eight, this is, uh, this is your Green New Deal. The raising of revenue and taxes for the support of this program is to come from reduction of swollen fortunes from the top. I love that. Uh, as well as the support of public works to give employment wherever there may be any slackening necessary in private enterprise. Yeah. This is your jobs guarantee. Yeah, I mean, and not just that, but uh, right, uh, the latter, the latter part, slackening necessary. Wouldn't that uh, having a thirty-hour work week or something like that? Yes, I think thirty or thirty-five. I can't remember, but yeah, whatever you know, anything to just get production under control and get people paid. And like he said explicitly, and his voting record to back him up. It's not just bull. Like every time, uh, the the. Roosevelt administration goes to the right, I vote against them. And every time they go to the left, I vote for them. And he did. He, 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 all the other Southern Democratic senators hated him because they were all conservatives. <laughs> they no, wanted nothing to do with him. But the, he, he found allies with progressive Republicans, some of them, and the, the Eastern Coast liberal Democrats who were pro-New Deal and maybe even a little further to the left than, than Roosevelt. And that, Roosevelt kind of poached his Social Security idea, right? Yeah, and when he did, he boasted about it. He said, "Finally, Roosevelt is uh, <laughs> is, is getting on the Huey Long plan." You know, he, he never wasted a moment to to get his get his political moment, no matter what people did. To give you an idea of how Roosevelt thought about Long, aside from saying he was one of the two most dangerous men in America, he conducted one of the first national political polls, Roosevelt did, to find out what people thought of Huey Long. And he found out that he had a, uh, he had nationwide recognition and he was popular enough that Roosevelt was concerned about him in the uh, 36 election. Absolutely. And he had every reason to be. And uh, to be fair, I mean, Huey was needling him, but Roosevelt really struck first by denying Huey and his organization any access to the patronage yep. um, jobs in Louisiana that the Democratic Party ran. And so he was cut out of that, and uh, and that really escalated things between the two. And Huey had enough control over the state that he didn't really worry about it too much. But it, it was, you know, this is why you do that. In the first, this is why you. This is why the reason for the corruption and the graft in the first place. You build your own network. So yep. when you go against the party leaders, which is what he was going to, what he would have to do. Yes. There's a lot of a lot of focus on any figure like this about did he really care about the common people or was it just so he could get more power? I don't give a shit. Who cares? Yeah. For him, the, the ends always justify the means. And he, there's even a quote in here where he says the reason to get power is to have power and to use it to help people. Uh, you see different like 
different uh, Huey Long's here too. You see the pragmatic, the cold, pragmatic, calculating one who needs to get power. You see the even like the idealist one where you talk about like how he wish he didn't need a massive patronage system where he wish he could just run as a normal politician but what he was up against was so entrenched it was so powerful that there's no way other way to do it from his perspective he had to build this system he had to get people the pop uh, the people on board that he had to you know prove that he could deliver and everything stemmed from that and he was able to take on you know companies like standard oil which pretty much unthinkable you know, even today, especially today. Back to Caesar. We asked me <laughs> asked that question. Here's a quote from Plutarch. When he entered on his office, he brought in bills which would would have been preferred with better grace by the most audacious of the tribunes than by the than by a consul, in which he proposed the plantation of colonies and the division of the lands simply to please the commonality. The best and most honorable of the senators opposed it, upon which, as he had long wished for nothing more than such a colorable pretext, he loudly protested against how much it was against his will to be driven to seek support from the common people, and how the Senate's harsh and insulting conduct left him no other course possible for him to devote himself henceforth to the popular cause. Absolutely. The, yeah, it's... the thing with patronage, this is, I, I don't want to break anyone's heart over here, around here, but this is, when you do representative democracy, when you do this, this thing, we, this, these Western style governments handed down to us that we're cosplaying Romans, this is how, this is what politics is. When, when, when the Citizens United decision came down, the, the, some of the reasons why they said if you want to really if you want your, to hear the state tell you this straight up go read that decision yeah i mean I, for me like i take from huey long like the idea that it's actually possible to oppose all that too to make the system work for you uh yeah i mean obviously but you had to build your own yeah i mean he didn't he didn't make it but um the fact that it can be done is interesting it's inspiring really like he didn't have a lot of means to get into politics. He just worked at it and abandoned any kind of decorum or, you know, uh, genteel conservatism to do. Well, he didn't abandon it. He never had those things in the first place, honestly. None of this came from academic circle jerking about will to power. It was something he intuitively understood, something that Caesar understood. Yeah. It's something that, all, that any kind of populist demagogue understands. Yeah. I, and, you know, there's there's an immune system in, in our government, uh, in our culture, against these people. And it, which is decorum is one of them. Proce you know, procedure, the left kind of hints at this right now, especially with the, not to bring him up again, but Bernard Sanders. A lot of complaining about procedure and... Uh, Why does he yell like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why does he yell like that? He's not specific. We we need uh we need more information about his plan. We need you know. They're always trying to pull you into their arena to fight their kind of battle, and you'll always lose. And people like Long know better than to do that. Yeah. And that's why they just end up fucking murdering them. Yeah, and I, I think it's interesting too. Like, there is a, I think some space. I mean, Long kind of shows that there is some space for. Um, procedure in the sense that like he always came off as rambunctious uh, impulsive just do something you know he would rush down to Louisiana after he was senator he still ran the state right so he rushed down to Louisiana and his governor would call a special legislature and he'd pass he'd get more uh, he'd get the legislature who was now almost entirely under his control all pro long people there's still a small opposition and, and get them to run out a whole bunch of bills in like five days or less. Like just power through everything. And he knew all the, the, the tricks to get things read quickly and passed through quickly so he could get on with his day. And he would, he much like this Warmouth guy that he, he idealized, he would go into the legislature as a senator. It, no power there, right? And he would just be directing like, yeah, you, you vote for, you guys vote for this. Yes, you'll read this. No, you'll, you'll stop reading this. Um, when they did the... Uh, uh, when they, they took the, the bill into a committee and they'd like interview people, it was just him. He was the only person they interviewed <laughs> for these things. And just see, talk about why the bill was awesome. 
why everyone was great and why, or why everyone should vote for it. And uh, and that Howard hates it. this, by the way, because they, they hate the idea of, of there being one person responsible. They, they'll call it autocracy or whatever, but the real problem is you said the uh, bog beef you talked about this before in a previous podcast power hates to be identified it wants to stay in the shadows if there's one man there's one guy sitting in the chair to explain to you, there's one guy responsible there's, they hate that yeah. because you can you can take one person and you can make him answer to something once it becomes something that's diffused and spread out to well we'd love to do this but we only have 59 votes and we need 60 and you know I'm sorry you guess you're not getting health care after all yeah too bad yeah power despises being identified it despises any opportunity for for us to you know, grab a hold of it. And that's why these demagogues are so dangerous. It's not because they're worried that, that they're going to become a king. It's that they're worried that they're going to expose the game. Yeah, and Hugh Long did that really explicitly. Like, all the, the sins, I guess you call them. I mean, whatever, but whatever. We've always, you know, kind of said patronage is patronage. But, like, all the sins of the system were laid bare with Hugh Long. He made power very explicit and very bare. And... And he just did what he wanted with it, and he continued to improve Louisiana. You know, the bid- bridges got built, more roads got paved, even as he was a U.S. senator, and spreading his message to other states. And uh, yeah, like you said, like like you said about the Roosevelt pool, he was f- he was finding. You know, he didn't have access to that pool necessarily. He was finding when he was going to campaign for, he would campaign for a, a, a sympathetic uh, senator, a woman actually. Um, in either Alabama or Miss, uh, Mississippi or Missouri, um, I've forgotten, but uh, he would find how popular he was, um, uh, and he would realize, like even in the Carolinas, where he thought he would have no chance, people were showing up, and it, this is what really got the ball. I mean, he was already always going to run for president, no, no doubt about that. But I think he started to really understand his popularity. One of my favorite stories from him and the Roosevelt feud that grew is Roosevelt eventually got unleashed one of his lieutenants to attack him on the ra- and uh, in a speech in New York and it got put on the radio so Huey uh, said well I'd like went to NBC and said I'd like some time to respond that's only fair they said sure and then you know all the affiliates started buying up time because Huey Long was going to talk on the radio and uh, and then when he found out about this he said okay now I, you guys are going to pay me and you're going to give me more time to talk. And they said, sure, whatever, you know. <laughs> so 25 million Americans listened to Huey Long respond and he spent, you know, two, as he always did, five minutes responding to what was said about him and then the rest talking about Share Our Wealth Program. Every time, every chance was a platform to, to spread the message. And I don't want to compare him to Trump because Trump doesn't warrant it. Trump is, could not carry Huey Long's jockstrap. But you see these. He said almost the same thing. They, they, right, they right. had a similar code. That was like, there are elements. You, you, mu- you have totally to elements. cover me. Yeah. Trump said, and Huey Long said something. They were like, "You have to put me on TV. I know you have to because I'm prime time, baby." Yeah. No, unless you're a complete dipshit, you can recognize that Trump's got some cl- some game. And he talks the talk, but he doesn't walk the yeah, walk. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's got the ability to do this stuff. He just yeah doesn't care, follow through. Huey Long is does both. Well, he's willing to get down and dirty and win power no matter what, and then he uses the power. I don't agree with what you said about Trump having the ability to do that. I don't think that he does. He's not the man that Long was. He doesn't He's not, He doesn't have the willpower. He doesn't have the, the brain for it. He has the attitude down, but he's not He's not a, a great man in the way that Huey Long was. Yeah. Mm. That's, this is where your network comes in. Because yeah. I strongly believe in in the executive. I'm a bit of a, a authoritarian guy, especially when it comes to this kind of politics. Because I, if you're talking about the common people, common people work. They they don't read the latest national review. They're not in on things. They don't go to the town halls. You need an executive you can trust in the king, the authoritarian, the Caesar. There's disadvantages to that. And the big one is assassination. Once they're gone, that's it. Yeah. And the other one is secession. You need to have a successor that does all these things, and it's the kind of thing where this is hardly ever the case. Yes, I mean, Caesar did, but he didn't, you know, follow up the way that Caesar wanted, but he did have a great man behind him. The, the problem is if you have if you have a perfect successor, they're going to push you out. So yeah. that's why he had that's why he had a uh, Mark he, Anthony Mark Anthony who was who was big dumb and loyal a, a great secondhand man but he was mincemeat to 
to uh, yeah. Augustus. Yeah. It's possible that Huey would have eventually had a successor, but, I mean, he was in his early he 40s when he was killed, yeah. so... That's the thing, oh, he's so young. He, yeah, very young. Yeah. Uh, let's we'll get, let's kind of get, get into the end. Uh, so he decided, he's in the Senate, he decides he's going to run for president, and he does something, and everybody, as you guys know, I don't read books. That shit's for nerds. He reads a shit little books. But of here's one that you have to read. That's the only time I'm ever going to tell you this. It's not a long book. It's a, a book that he wrote that is essentially fan fiction of, about his first days in office. Yeah. It, it sounds it, wild. It, it's, it's fucking incredible. It's My First Days in the White House by Hugh Long. And in it, he writes self-insert fan fiction about all these fa- all these famous people eating shit. <laughs> and he's like, he, br- he brings in Roosevelt and Hoover and tells them, yeah, I'm putting you guys in the cabinet. And they're offended because they were former presidents. <laughs> and he tells them, well, you didn't have anything better to do anyway. Yeah. And then he, he cocks J.P. Morgan. <laughs> and <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, Morgan's the only one who doesn't get, yeah. In on it. Yeah, J.P. Morgan writes him a letter saying he didn't like the whatever bill he was He said, well, I, I welcome the ire of the international bankers. It's, you have to read this. It's amazing to understand the man because this is, this is you know, beamed directly from his brain to you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, he wrote an autobiography that uh, uh, I think covers a lot of, you know, self-aggrandizement, mm-hmm. but it lays out his philosophy and his ideas and where he was going. Uh, his plans for the future, like we have some idea of what he was planning, and it's pretty incredible. Like he was fully ready that he to accept that he wasn't going to win the thirty-six nomination, and then he so he was ready to run as an, either a third party or back a young progressive candidate and act as spoiler to Roosevelt. <laughs> And he would yeah. sink the Roosevelt's presidential chances, get a Republican administration in, and he figured four years of the Republicans would completely annihilate the country, and then he would be so popular by 1940 he'd be elected, no problem. Mate, yeah, four years of Alf Landon, and what we would be begging for. Yeah, him. yeah. No. Didn't, didn't, didn't some enterprising podcasters say that? Bernard Sanders should have done exactly that after 2016. I mean, maybe. I don't know. Are you saying you don't listen to our podcast? Oh, shit. How dare you? Cut this right now. <laughs> okay, so he made his, he made his big plans to uh, to run for, for office, but they got cut short because uh, he was mysteriously gunned down by a son of a political opponent, correct? Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, I mean, as funny as these things are, because dashed all the hopes of a lot of people. So he was in, in um, Baton Rouge, the state capital, and uh, a young man named Dr. I've forgotten his first name, Dr. Weiss, Dr. Weiss, however you want to call oh, it, Weiss. pulled a pistol on him, and uh, his bodyguards open up, and in the, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the shootout, Huey was hit a couple times and taken to the hospital, and they didn't have um, any of the star surgeons available. They were, they were out of town, so they had whoever uh, stitch him up, and they missed um, the blood. Uh, the fact that mm. his kidney was perforated, so blood started getting into his kidney. And by the time they, the the surgeons showed up, they realized it was too late. He died. Um, yeah, it's it, the guy was um, young. The guy who shot him was a, a young. Well, theoretically, some people say bodyguard shot him because he was getting too powerful there's a lot of uh, good myths and uh, conspiracy yeah. theories around that assassination but if you just take the most boring um, which I believe because usually it's the most the truest story is often the, the most boring and mundane and embarrassing one is uh, the doctor just pulled a pistol on him uh, maybe the bodyguards shot first and hit him or he fired back and hit Huey and he was the son. He was the son-in-law of a judge who's basically going. Who was an anti-long judge, and um, the par- one of the parishes that the judge represented was pro-long, and they wanted, you know, they they got frustrated because this judge kept getting elected, and they hadn't have any say. So basically, Long was gonna Huey Long was just gonna have the the judge gerrymandered into a more populous. Uh, um, yeah, that's what he was doing when he was shot, right? Like he was, he was yeah, he was doing a bunch of things, but yeah, that was one of it. That was the process. 
Um, and, you know, like, the way some people talk about it, like, he was justified killing this. Like, as if gerrymandering is, you know, justified for killing someone now. Um, America would be a goddamn bloodbath <laughs> these days. But, yeah, that's that was the great he was sin glad that Huey Long did. He, he gerrymandered this in one of his political enemies into a, uh, a, a, a district where he would probably lose. Put on your tinfoil hats. I'm going to give you a, give you an alt take on this. So we, we talked about Bolivia a little bit. No. And I just offhandedly, I told, I, I told Merrick, I said, yeah, the CIA did it. And he was like, well, wait, what? The CIA did it? He said, send me the piece. I said, no, I'm just telling you the CIA <laughs> did it. And so here, here's what I'm going to tell you how I, how I operate with this stuff. The CIA's, their job description is to do things like the coup happened, like the coup in Bolivia. That's what they do. This is their, their basic job function. And they're going to go in and they're going to help, they're going to rewrite the, the constitution to make it one way or the other. This is their job description. Point two, you're not allowed to know very much about the CIA. It's, it's, there's a secret. There's secrecy stuff around design, it. So, yeah. so, so you can't just you can't just go ask the CIA did they do it? I don't really know if they did it, but I just say they did it. I'm probably going to be right like 85 percent of the time. Sometime I'll be wrong, and it was just a chance. But in general, I just say yeah, the CIA did, it. and I don't think about it. I don't think about it any more than that. That's what I do. So now we're talking about Huey Long. MLK has this great career. He spends the summer reading Marx, and all of a sudden he's full of holes. The Gracchi brothers in Rome. You have Saturninus. You have you have Julius Caesar. Um, you start talking about. Do you want to do this land reform? Now he's full of holes. Now we're talking about this guy uh, Huey Long. There's big stakes. There's very big stakes, and he's full of holes. I was listening to to Adolf Reed interview a few weeks ago. And uh, and they asked they they were they were talking about Bernie. They were like, oh, are you excited about things this and that? They said, what do you think is going to happen? Is he going to move the money around and stuff? And um, and uh, he said, what do you think is going to what do you think is going to be the response? And he's like, well, they'll kill him. And and he said it very smooth. He said he said it <laughs> without an without an ounce of of uh, without an ounce of affect. And they're like, wait, what do you mean? What do you know? What, what what's going on? And he says, there's very big stakes. There's very big stakes. So when you're talking about, um, oh yeah, Bernie Sanders is going to move uh, all this money from rich people to poor people, um, you're not necessarily going to die, but there's going to be attempt. And this is where the doc. It may be the doctor doesn't show up. By the way, these people fuck up all the time too. Caesar managed to live. The Bay of Pigs didn't work out. Uh, these people do. Uh, Castro died of old age. Uh, these people do fuck up, but. Uh, they most of the time they don't. Yeah, you wouldn't bet against. I mean, there are, there are some spectacular fuck ups against Huey Long. Like people called him paranoid, but uh, there were several like almost armed revolts, uh, different plans. Uh, no they one... tried to organize a military against him and shit. Yeah, there's a this this group called the Square. When he uh, proposed raising another tax on the Standard Oil, and there was um, back and forth sparring between him and Standard Oil about taxes and and them pulling out of the state there's some workers that got together that end up including a guy who just worked for standard oil not an employee but like a, a strike breaker whose last name i swear to god was bourgeoisie uh <laughs> yeah and they formed this thing called the the square deal association that um mm -hmm. basically started massing guns they weren't very competent and huey being uh, Huey had already planted a spy in the main executive, so he already knew what was going on. So he basically marched them into a trap and had the state police there ready. And uh, nice. to the state police's credit, they didn't kill anyone. The only one who got hurt was someone getting shot by one of their own square dealers' uh, shotgun, you know, accidentally as they ran away. Uh, they all got put under technical arrest so they could just go home. And it was, you know, very soft hands. I mean, like, Huey gets accused of a lot of things. He may have technically kidnapped someone briefly. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. That no, no, uh, no, it gets really played up. Like he, there's this guy who had some dirt on Huey or something uh, during one of the elections, and uh, they briefly relocated him because he was a drunk and uh, just wanted to keep him under wraps for a couple hours. But he spun this into a, a story about he was kidnapped for days and this sort of thing. So, like, mm. you know, it's... It's not great, but it's not what it ended oh, up being. Oh, I love it. Yeah, but uh, Huey Long, as far as I can tell, never tried to get anyone killed. Never, you know, attacked anyone. He used state power. I mean, he used the state police a lot, but 
no one got gunned <laughs> down, you know? And that's, that's, I'm sorry, it's just that, I just finished this. Uh, that, to me, is a strike against the whole, he was a fascist, or he was a real, real authoritarian, that sort of thing. Mm. Like, yeah. he didn't seem to embrace that kind of level of violence. I saw on Wikipedia, Daily Worker called him the uh, Louisiana Hitler, or American Hitler, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But then there are other socialists who are, like, really, there are other labor and socialist groups that were absolutely adored him and because of his uh, how he voted in the Senate. Staying alive becomes job number one. Yeah. Yeah. It's important to keep it in the context of of the thir- uh, the mid thirties. Uh, yeah. The New Deal was in was uh, by the way at the time the New Deal wasn't necessarily working. <laughs> it wasn't really even implemented. Honestly. Yeah, he, um, my timeline might be off. It wasn't this time at Roosevelt kind of reversed course, and there was a another miniature rec- recession. Yes, wasn't this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Long was offering much more radical solutions. And then there's an argument, especially conservatives like to make about Roosevelt, which is that the New Deal really didn't end the Depression, that World War II did, and that Roosevelt wanted us to get involved in World War II explicitly for that reason. He wanted a war with Japan to get the uh, economy out of its doldrums. Now, this is a cons- that's a conspiracy theory, but as you know, I believe every conspiracy theory I hear. So you can see why someone like Long would be so dangerous. Uh, if he had come to power, and let's say uh, we didn't get into uh, into a war with Japan, uh, he would have probably had uh, excuses to implement some of his more radical ideas. If the country's not mobilized in 1941 for World War II, and long you know, long runs in 40, like you said, we don't go to war. Uh, the the economic situation is still pretty bad. Uh, we could have seen some of these more radical moves, couldn't we? Yeah. And I mean, Long didn't have a lot of forays into for, foreign policy, but he did was very much an isolationist in that vein. And Roosevelt was certainly not. Yes, no, the complete opposite of Roosevelt in that respect. Which one could one could argue, and it has been argued that a lot of our policy in the Pacific, leading up to the war, was in, in antagonizing Japan. Yeah. But so you can see how Long could have room to have a much more radical agenda. Yeah. And so. For all our complaints about 2019 and wealth inequality and standards of living declining, it's nothing compared to what the situation was in, in 1935. Yeah, you don't have the, the the available credit and you don't have the like material wealth that we have today, um, even if a lot of that's inaccessible for people. It's, it seemed like things could go anyway. This is when the business plot happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And when Roosevelt was considered too radical. Meanwhile, uh, Long was voting against the early sort of proposed Social Security old age pension uh, law because he was because in that incarnation, uh, local there were local boards that could basically dole out the pension to people in the, the community, and he was afraid that, especially in the South, it would they would just straight up uh, uh, keep out African Americans from getting anything, which kind of flies in the face of the whole racist uh, thing. Moniker. And a lot of this conflict with Roosevelt over the New Deal involved who was going to control the money they were doling out. Yeah. And that's a very <laughs> you could, well, one way you could argue that's selfish, but another way you could argue that's very smart because I'm a firm believer in the states having some autonomy just for the just for this very reason. You can all it's a lot easier to produce a Huey Long from the state government than it is to out of whole cloth and national. Absolutely. And this is one of the reasons why I think someone like Huey Long, they, they killed him. And they had to kill him. It was too big of a risk. And they won't kill Bernard Sanders because he's not a big risk. He's uh, not in his 40s either. That's, that's true. true. But he's not going to, he's not going to set up uh, <laughs> a parallel government. He's not going to step out of line. He, he's, he wouldn't conspire against the party to make them lose an election so that he could get in the power. And you could say, well, that's good, and you probably don't need that kind of guy in 2019 anyway. But that's why Adolf Reed is wrong. They're not going to kill Bernard Sanders. If he wins the election, they'll just make sure that he can only pass the safe progressive parts uh, that he promises base, and mysteriously the wealth tax won't happen. None of that stuff will happen. Because (laughs) for as much as I admire the man, He's not a great man in the way that Huey Long was. Well, I, 
will say, like, it's one thing for Huey Long to say this stuff, another thing for him or Sanders to say to do it too, because you need a legislature, and Huey Long didn't have a lot of allies in the legislature. That would have been another very uh, difficult battle, but certainly he at least had the organization in Louisiana, and he was there were all these out oh, share our wealth clubs popping up across the United States, mainly in California and and Louisiana, but certainly in other cities uh, in, in the north and east as well. I, I could paint you a picture to get to, to, for Bernie to do it. It, it, okay. it, w- it would help a lot more if you, if you spot me 15 years on Bernie's age. Right. I, I'm not even considering that. I'm saying that I think that he, uh, when I say he's not a great man, I mean he's not a good man. I think he's one of the... You know, most humane, et cetera, a, a, a great person, but like the you know the great man of history, type that that kind of overbearing. Yeah, I would do anything to in, in, enforce my will. He's not that, and that's the difference. That's the kind of people they are so afraid of. They'll they'll kill. But you go ahead, spot us. A, I'll spot you fifteen years. Oh. Give us the rundown. Okay. So by, and by the way, Reed didn't 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 just announce that this was going to happen. Uh, by the way, I, I am announcing uh, Bernie Sanders is going to get me to a week before the California primary. <laughs> okay, spot me 15 years. When all the, all the things that Trump did try to pass did get eat up by see, the swamp, whatever. This is all like these judges and the rule it unconstitutional, these the kind of things. Right. Bernie isn't by himself. Uh, he has like all these justice Democrat people. He's got. Um, they would help him shred the Constitution to abolish ICE and shit like that. But no, they're not going to go to the. They're not going to go to the wall for a wealth tax. They're not going to go it's jobs guarantee. And if they did, whatever version of it they would produce would be shitty, and it wouldn't. It, it just wouldn't happen. Things need to get worse. For, yes, of course. For that to happen. That, it, it, that's one reason why what I said was bombastic and not entirely fair to Bernard Sanders. Because, A, we're not in a place where people are, are going to be willing to just throw everything in the garbage and take a huge risk like we might have in the 30s. And, two, the hostile forces of the, in the government that are against Sanders are a lot more entrenched and powerful than they were in 1935. The, the, we've, we've had, since basically the end of World War II, the technocracy has ruled us, and it's become more ingrained in the culture and institutions, and it's extremely powerful. Now, they don't have to kill people anymore, necessarily. And that's something that Long didn't have to contend to. The government was not interventionist, didn't have, as crazy as it sounds, like the government wasn't as powerful as it is now. Uh, By the way, you know what? who started that. Well, it's Roosevelt's yeah, Ro- brain trust. Yeah, Ro- yeah, Roosevelt is the progenitor of the technocracy in America, yes. Wow, what a revenge. A smaller example would be Russ Pro, where they went in and they changed all these rules so that a guy like that couldn't scare him again. could never happen again. Yeah, I mean, Huey Long, I mean, was progenitor of the, uh, the the state of Louisiana, too. I mean, there was a real demand for this, this government to do that, to do stuff, to start intervening, start making changes. So, yeah, whoever happened to be running government at that time basically got to craft a lot of the uh, the uh, state jobs and, and technocracy, uh, bureaucracy that ran everything. Well, you're an educated man, so maybe you can... Uh give your opinion on this. To me, the patronage networks, that is part of the bureaucracy, accurate. I don't consider the same thing as technocracy because I think this is this is more of like wheeling and dealing and uh, scratch your back and scratch mine. That's not what happens. It, it um, That does still happen, but that's not the primary focus. When I say technocracy, I think of uh, this is all codified. This guy went to Harvard. He's got all the right opinions. He's got the right pedigree. We're going to put him here. He's here because of his aptitude. That's the story that you're that you're given he's he's a really good manager uh, of the government that's why he's doing it look at trump trying to staff trying to get staff that'll (laughs) that's not uh, ratting on him and stuff he has to get him out of these he has to get him out of these think tanks and shit guys with who went to harvard and yale princeton and they don't give a fuck about him if 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 you read if you if you're into what the right the far right's talking about they talk about the permanent bureaucracy and they love the hate they love to hate the state department etc I think they're right about that, that there was a change that happened in the, uh, at the turn of the century when Huey Long was a young man, we basically didn't have a State Department. The U.S. Diplomatic Corps was a joke. Uh, compare, compare that to now, and it, it, a lot of that happened after World War II. It happened in you know our grandparents' lifetime. Here's my black pill for everybody. 
because of the scare that they got in the 30s, they rearranged the entire system in a way that makes sure that we can never get another Huey Long until, as, as Bog Beef said, things get so bad that people are willing to risk everything for change. And we're not there. We won't, probably won't be there for a long time. And that is the problem with populist politics, pro- progressive politics for the left. You're contending with the permanent bureaucracy and they completely intertwine with the ruling class in a way that normal people don't think about. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why you're not going to see if we we might not see another freewheeling Huey Long type in our lifetime. I've seen arguments that uh, that's what the Soviet revolutionaries had to do. And they eventually compromised because they couldn't out the entire Russian bureaucracy. They had to work with it and. People, some people would argue that that's what compromised the whole Bolshevik revolution. There is one, there's one alternative, and we mentioned his name several times this podcast. Julius Caesar was not an outsider. He was not a self-made man. He was a, a class trader, aristocrat, who saw an opening. And unfortunately, that's what I mean by we're not going to see a, a Huey Long. You're probably going to have to see a very ambitious member of this social caste who's willing to maybe step out and take a little bit extra for himself. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing I could say on the subject of technocracy, and I don't know, maybe we're past that, but the only thing is, like, Huey Long did bring in experts to build bridges to get roads paved. Um, If you want the trappings of modernity, and a lot of people do, especially in those days, you, you do need... It was just... He he even stole experts from other states. You know, he offered them more money, bring them in, get the stuff done. Uh, you do need some of that for some highly technical jobs. So it's a great point. It, it's you it's you know like anti intellectualism. Yeah, you can you can argue that it's just uh, I guess if you were the kind of like a uh, you know the, the the system isn't the problem; it's the people in it. Uh, that would be the argument, <laughs> right? Like yeah. it's the wrong people from Harvard or whatever. You know. It, but I mean, I, w- I would say that Huey Long did start that in Louisiana because they did need these things to build the schools, to build hospitals, to build roads, and those that, two bridges that key. Bon Beef, uh traveled down. <laughs> yeah, you're, and that's the key, I think. And we we understand this, and almost uh, it's in our DNA when it comes to the military uh, in America. The at least in part of our mythos is that the, you know the military and the civilian government need to be separate. The civilian government has to have authority over the military. The, we need a military, but they have to be you know wholly subservient to the people that we elect. That's the deal with the these you know, ex, these experts. They they need to be subordinate yes. to elected officials, and they're not. And this is no more clear than you can watch what's happening. And I, I don't recommend that you watch what's happening in our politics. But right now, there's a the impeachment hearing. It essentially, comes down to some bureaucrats didn't like what the president allegedly said to another foreign leader, and we're gonna and we're now having a discussion whether he should be removed from his job because they thought that what he said was improper. The man who was elected president of the United States. Yeah, well, Huey Long said some naughty words and he almost got impeached too, so. CNN ran that thing the other day that was like, uh, hell yes, there's a swamp, and, they, and they're and they patriots and stuff. Yeah, they were crowing about it when he first got elected. And to your credit, Bob Beef, you said this from the start. They, they were going to... Yeah, that he wasn't going to be able to pass anything. Yeah, because of the bureaucracy. The, um... The uh, Huey Long, he took active because, and like you said, uh, you you're not they're drain the swamp. That's not going to happen. And but and and what Huey Long did was he operated out of LSU. He had his own guys. People don't even understand how much like e- even if everybody was nice and even if there wasn't a swamp and stuff, uh, universities do operate so much of the government. You just have no idea. Yeah, I mean the LSU really. Um... And it seemed like early universities in general relied on the government, the sort of patronage back and forth between government and university and back and forth. Because, it, I mean, they really were the institutions of the elite. Um, one of the things Huey Long did was establish a medical school for people who couldn't afford the school in LSU. So poor people who had the, the knack could 
become doctors, which the state probably needed anyway. Um, I know up here the, there was a huge shortage of doctors uh, in the 20s and 30s. And my dad, like, asked his doctor, like, uh, about it, and uh, he said the passing rate was 30% on the exam. And he stopped and said, I'm not going to tell you what I got on it. <laughs> Jesus. Before we, uh, if we're, I don't know if we're wrapping up or whatever, but I want to throw a little good old boy's sauce on what you said. Uh, rain and swamp can happen. It won't happen now, but it can happen. And, and there's, there's a reason for it that we've talked about already. It's that these people, uh, they might be good at building bridges. They, they might understand how the Federal Reserve works. But they're really bad at delivering very basic things to people. And you could argue they've lost control over the universities and social policy. And uh, perhaps the way you're going to drain the swamp eventually is that when a regular person will put up with uh, technocratic rule if uh, you know the trains are running on time, the electricity stays on, you, you've got a full belly. I'm not sure that will be true if they accomplish the social changes they want to like families and sexual relations and the, this restructuring of society that keeps popping uh, bubbling out of the of academia like a a broken sewer main every few months this show's international dre you're canadian i was talking um i was listening to this interview one time this they were interviewing this um extreme neo-nazi guy in canada Canadian white supremacist guy, and they and they asked him like, okay, so you're so you know you're in on the movement. Well, how do you see things playing out in the future? And uh, he's like, uh, well, nothing's going to change. And he's like, well, what do you well what do you guys do? Like, what's what's the plan for the? He's like, no, he says uh, Canada's too well run. No one's ever going to let us do anything. <laughs> that's that's true on both sides, I think, <laughs> uh, of the spectrum, like. As someone who's like just sort of spiraling left wing, uh, yeah, there's there's no hope for, you know, breaking the the political power. Like you think, you know, America's bad. Like you, Bog Beef, you and I have talked about that book, um, the the Dictator's Handbook. I love it. And uh, and how like they talk about how to, you have the that what was it called the captive population. Uh, you, it's you been a minute. There's. Essential coalition. Central coalition. You need to have to have yeah. a central coalition to achieve power. And there's like all these like authoritarian countries and Canada that all you need a small chunk of the population to run everything. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's the situation in Canada with our current electoral system. Is uh, you know you just need just enough people, like thirty, thirty-five percent of the vote, and you're good to go. Yeah, your your Gini coefficient is way too high for anything to get weird <laughs> anytime soon. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we we can say this in uh, in the history and the history kind of shit, and it, it it is true from the way only this is the only world we can imagine. But someone who uh, one of those conservatives that Huey Long fought against early on in his career at the turn of the century, you know, the Gilded Age, they couldn't have imagined uh, a government. That uh, you know directly taxed income, that paid out pensions, that paid out welfare, that did all the things that our government does now, and we take for granted. Yeah. They 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 just never would have believed it was a possibility because you never it, you the world feels static and these things seem impossible right up until the moment that everything falls apart and suddenly it is possible, which is why you have to keep you have to keep people on the back burner. That's one of the best arguments for Bernard Sanders is that we had this guy had him like him and Corbin we kept them on ice for a while and now they have ideas that might help us out as things get worse. Um, yeah, you can't underestimate the the impact Huey Long had with his policies on on even Roosevelt, just pushing left, pushing left, pushing left. Um, maybe small consolation to what you got. I don't know, but the reason why Sanders is you do have to consider him is that is the Medicare for all. It's been done other places. It would it would be both Huey Long level like. These these companies are, are monstrous. They're they're mad. They're, they're, yeah, these insurance companies, the medical the medical uh, industry. You know, this is like thirty percent of the GDP. These, My dad doesn't have health insurance, so you know, I mean, this is a game changer for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, and um, he, so you know, the, this is this guy's plan for the whole time. It seems 
it seems like he uh, he, he could do it. And if he did, that is, and and by the way, that's one of the good things. We're not going to be a communist country probably anytime soon. But if you do get these, these, uh, look at what happens when people talk about uh, someone's going to take take away your social security. Once you get that, once you get that, these these medical programs passed. How much esteem do people hold that in Canada? I mean, there is a greatest Canadian show in the aughts, I think, and number one guy was tommy douglas who was the leader of the saskatchewan ndp party or ndp who uh created the first health care program the provincial and then got it to go national so to answer your question i would say look at bolivia and uh yes the average person will not accept will not uh be accepting of changes to these programs but you have to be very careful about how you do it because the people who pay for it do sometimes object and uh, they make their own moves. Yeah. It was depressing, wasn't it? <laughs> I was trying to be optimistic about Huey Long. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's all good. One of the best things about Huey Long is that we, he's still available. You can, you can go on YouTube and listen to him. If you can get a taste of a, of a future that could have been. What I like about Long is that he is someone who... He didn't get this idea from a, a great political philosopher from the 19th century uh, this was something that came from his faith and that, that made it extremely accessible to everyone there was not there was no baggage that came along with it and that's the biggest problem that we have to right now with any kind of populist movement that's remotely popular is that it has baggage from academic arguments or people with uh, wacky ideas about skull shapes. And I think that someone like him, it's hard to underestimate the power of an accessible populist demagogue. Yeah, it seems like everyone, a lot of people in the United States have forgotten uh, how to achieve power, and Yui Long provides a pretty good uh, path to it. Through the, through the state legislators, through through the state, um, and lots of little lessons and like how to manage power, how to build it, uh, from everything from just being ruthless with your enemies, but also never quite destroying them. Uh, there was a mayor in New Orleans; he never really beat until the end. Uh, mayor like Emmett Walmsley, I think his name was, and he just left them. You know, he could have outed them by just stacking the right districts and, and the, the, the city council because the state had a lot of control and he just left him there because he was a really useful punching bag when he needed one uh, just like you know he's never take, going to take down the standard oil company but he could consistently humble them and humiliate them for the benefits of the people and he, 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 he did it all he, he absolutely knew how to get power and then hold it and then use it and I think there's a lot of important lessons people should probably pick up on today if you want his kind of politics implemented where you live. There was a story in his autobiography that there was a Methodist family that moved in next to them and their family gave them food because they were suffering hard times. And later on, the one of the sons of the Methodist family became a, a politician and he opposed Huey Long. In the long, long sent him a message. Tell him, tell him one thing. I'm still glad my folks didn't let them starve. But there is and always has been a providence who understands and who does not forget. <laughs>